pause with my chewing gum so I wouldn't have to do both at the same time. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I got smicha later on in life. It took me a, a little bit longer, but uh, we don't have to go into that at this juncture. Okay. Was that one of the tests of getting smicha is, is uh, chewing gum and talking at the same time? <laughs> no. <laughs> that explains it. it was <laughs> uh, so actually, when I was younger, um, I was I, I didn't feel like I was a rabbi yet. So um, uh, when I was at Yeshiva Sprisk, uh, when my younger days, I did not um, complete my my smicha program, my uh, rabbinical ordination. Later on in life, uh, I, I uh, went to Masif um, the Torah Vidas and uh, completed my rabbinical studies there. So, okay, we left off in chapter 18, uh, sorry, 17 of Isaiah. Start in the correct chapter. 17, you said? Yeah, that, that week we inverted the chapters. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, you know, we were chewing gum at the same time. So and now we got it going. So. Okay, yeah. we learned about, about the uh, Moab. Now we're going to do a prophecy about Damascus. The, remember, the southern uh, Syria, as we know today, was uh, the, the, the country of Aram. That, that was the same country of, of uh, Lavan from, uh, from the book of Genesis. And uh, so th that's the same area with the city of Damascus. So in this chapter, Damascus will, will be a euphemism for the entire country of, um, of Aram. And uh, the north of, of Syria, as we know today, is the Assyrian um, Empire at the time. So the the Aram, remember, they're the ones who joined with the northern kingdom of Israel to attack uh, Jerusalem under the reign of Ahaz, King Ahaz. Uh, and and uh, then Assyria, the northern kingdom of, of Syria, uh, is the one that, that uh, laid to waste um, all areas about it before the Babylonians became power. That was the Assyrian Empire under under Sanherib, Sanacherib. Uh, so that happened under um, under um, uh, the next king, Hezekiah uh, Hezekiah. Okay, both are mentioned in this book. And again, chronologically, the Book of Isaiah was written before the books of Kings and and Chronicles. So this is the uh, first official count uh, as recorded in in the books of prophets. Now, this is amazing that before we're talking about Israel, the prophecies are going uh, talking about the nations, not the righteous nations, the wicked nations. So it, if, it, it's, it's a logical uh, inference. If God is concerned about the wicked nations, certainly he's concerned about the righteous nations. So therefore, uh, the... the um, the efforts to try to save and, and admonish and warn and hopefully help uh, repentance of the wicked nations is, is, is really an amazing thing. Um, God's giving a chance to, to the worst among us. So therefore the best among us should have hope. It, it should be innate. And of course, this book is going to have lots of consolations, especially beginning around chapter 40 uh, for Israel and uh, good people. Okay, this is chapter 17. Let's, let's go into the Hebrew and we'll uh, have translators and discuss some of the commentaries. Okay, here we go. Page 130 in the um, Middlestein edition of Isaiah. Masa Damasek, Kine Damasek, Musar Meir Vahaisam E Mapala. 
Azuvos are our air, Adorim Tihiana Rabsu, the in Maharid. Venishvas, Mivzor, me Ephraim, the Mamlacha, Midamesek, Usha or Aram, Tihavod, Ben Israel, Yihu, Numa, the Night's Vos. And we have a volunteer translator, first three verses. First three verses. A prophecy concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus will be uh, negated from being a city, and it will be heaped up. It will be heaped up. It will be uh, a not, heap of, it yeah. will be a heap of rubble. I was trying to turn the page. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's that chewing the gum thing. <laughs> uh, uh, deserted will be the cities of Oroir. Yes, Oroir. They will be for flocks that will lie down with none to disturb them. The stronghold will cease from Ephraim and monarchy from Damascus and the rest of Amram. They will be like the glory of the children of Israel, the word of Hashem, master of legions. Okay, so um, even though it's about Damascus, <clears throat> it's also mentioning Ephraim. Now it's important to mention Ephraim because Ephraim uh, turned uh, Damascus into a mercenary to help him defeat, um, to, to defeat uh, Hezekiah, well, to defeat um, uh, um, Ahaz, uh, Hezekiah's uh, father. Remember, Ahaz, uh, it, it, the, the, the four kings in, uh, in su succession was um, after there had been three generations of righteous kings of Judah, Ahaz was the first of, of the um, very evil kings. But again, his evil was was from um, uh, from weakness. He, he was addicted to idolatry, so he could not wait to go to the idolatrous temple after the, the public service in the in the regular in the in the real temple. Uh, so he put an idol on in the courtyard of, outside the the holy temple, so that um, he could do idolatry the moment he got out of uh, out of uh, uh, synagogue. It was kind of like. Uh, a child who spurns his study the moment he, he uh, gets out of class, he throws his books on, in the mud and stuff. However, he was allowing the people to serve God still. He did not corrupt the, the divine worship. He left it in the hands of the Kohenic, the, the high priest. Uh, so therefore, um, even though uh, Ahaz did great sins, um, he is, is not um, as evil as the kings that came later on. But before the evil king started to appear that were worse than Ahaz, there was the great Hezekiah that the uh, sages of Talmud say were, was, was eligible to be Mashiach, uh, almost. Okay, so we have to look in the commentary here. It, it's, it's fascinating um, that um, Part of the warning is to explain that uh, there will be uh, no protection for for Damascus just because they're, they're buddies with with Ephraim, even though God blessed the, the the Jewish people to receive special protections uh, and stuff like that. Uh, it's it's going to um, uh, not not protect uh, Damascus if they join with the um, evil kingdom to the north to try to destroy uh, Jerusalem. So What's the evil kingdom of the north? Uh, the, the Ephraimites, the, 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 the northern kingdom of Israel at, at that time. I don't know my directions of Israel. <laughs> so the, the Galilean uh, empire, as opposed to the Judean empire. Oh. Sumerian empire. Uh, and um, it was also called by the name of the capital city, Shamron. Shamron, Shamron was a mountaintop. Uh, it was a fortress on a mountain. And um, 
Uh, thank God. Um, last time I was in Israel, I got to see uh, the the uh, actual uh, Shomron Mountain. Fascinating. So they, they built that mountain with about ten rows of of a, of a winding road, so that at each stage, if if the um, if the defenses were defeated, they they would still have nine rows or eight rows or seven rows of archers. Um, defending the the, uh, the the king so it was a fascinating um uh, strategic uh, uh, built, uh, structure for for so long ago uh, again this was this was um this was over uh, 2500 years ago it's a long time ago so now now this the First, I'm going to explain it outside before we go inside. Inside, it, um, bringing in um, Ephraim creates a more difficult explanation because now we have to explain how, how how the promises to Israel is cut off from Ephraim, but not from Judah. Why why is God's promise of protection cut off from them? And but outside. It's it's incredible. Uh, uh, it's incredible a lesson that if if you're sincere with God, so then He sincerely keeps the commitments He made as well. If you corrupt yourself, so uh, then you're corrupting the deal of protection and blessing. So it, you know, from the outside, it's 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 easier to understand. And inside, we have to actually explain it with some of the commentaries. But um, it's it's just a fascinating example. Even the, even Israel did not protect the nation that that joined to help it because they were fighting against God's uh, God's temple and and the righteous who were defending it. Who do you mean when you say inside or outside? Okay, so from the outside perspective, uh, if you join with bad guys. Even if they're descended from Israel, it's not a protection. Okay, so that's that's logically logical that if you join with bad guys, you don't get the, the special protection just because they happen to be Jewish. It, it doesn't. It's not a protection in and of itself, uh, in under every circumstance. Especially in this case of rebellion, they they were trying to to use violence against uh, the the uh, Judean Empire. Uh, and but we see that the people of Judah were still righteous. It was only their king um, who was was uh, introducing idolatry into the picture. And and some people along the periphery started to, uh, to experiment. So that's why it became a war. However, uh, this is a war they easily defeated, even though there was two armies. Each of the armies were bigger than the Judean army. Yet uh, Judah. Uh, uh, withstand the, the defeat and defeated them without uh, any severe any severe losses. Uh, so let's look inside at the commentary. Okay, so if we turn to page 131 in the art scroll, in the second column, there, there's a comment, commentary for 17 in the English. Okay, so now, Look at this incredible concept. God is going to reassure the evil king of Judah that don't worry, I'm going to protect you. Again, we're talking about the evil king who set up an idol publicly for the Judeans. No, but no, no king of Judah ever dared to do it before Ahaz. He had the audacity to to publicly, uh, uh, you know, shame himself. He, he was a descendant of King David. A forefather of Mashiach, and uh, he he publicly set up an idol. It's very very shameful as far as 
um, you know, if, if uh, King David was there, what, how would he look at his grandfather without being uh, utterly shamed? Certainly before God in, in heaven. However, the first thing God does is to reassure uh, the evil king of Judah. And that, remember, the only merit he had was simply not destroying the temple. It, he left it uh, with the uh, previous uh, koanim led uh, orthodoxy. He did not try to change the orthodoxy of the, of the temple. And that, that was his only merit that we, we, we see in, in, the, in the book. And um, he's instantly given, don't worry, you're gonna be okay. It's, it's an amazing, amazing concept. <laughs> okay, so um, now this also helps us understand a little bit of why the current state of Israel is successful uh, in, in, for the most part, even though it's, not, uh, it's mostly not religious. Nevertheless, it, God has been protecting it and it made it successful in wars uh, because they're not forcing an end to, to uh, religion. They're letting people have freedom of religion. Uh, now, of course, they haven't made the philosophical jump yet that even on the Temple Mount, the, the holiest place in Judaism, you'd think they'd also let a freedom of religion there. They haven't fully come to that appreciation yet. But as far as not trying to um, stop uh, yeshivas from teaching Torah and things like that, they have been um, a, a source of support for yeshivas, uh, even having uh, programs that supported it. So therefore, uh, it's, it's, um, we see why that this could work in part from this chapter that we're, we're reading here. Okay, let's look at the commentary. Masa Damasek, a prophecy concerning Damascus. Previously in chapter seven, uh, scripture recorded that Rezin of Aram had formed an alliance with Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of, of, northern, uh, of the northern kingdom, to attack Jerusalem and destroy the kingdom of Judah. <clears throat> so it, it is, again, I, my guess is not just, it's not just about a convenient army, but um, remember the, the mothers of the Jewish people came from Aram. Yaakov Avinu married his, the, the daughters of Laban, the Aramean. Uh, so therefore, they're going to their cousins, the, the northern kingdom, to help them. In addition to the cousins, again, there are certain prophecies of guaranteed help to the children of Israel if they're doing good. Uh, but uh, again, good is as defined by God. You can't make a subjective good and then say, oh, we think this is good. Therefore, uh, you know, we just get uh, some Jews on our side and we can get away with it. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. What is God's objective truth? What is God's objective good? At that time, Isaiah prophesied to Ahaz, king of Judah, that he need not be concerned because Aram and the northern kingdom would never rule over Jerusalem. Isaiah also informed him that both Aram and Samaria would soon be destroyed. The following prophecy was said when Rezin and Pekach joined forces to attack Judah. Masa Damasek, a prophecy concerning uh, Damascus. Uh, actually, the word Masa in Hebrew usually can be translated the burden. It, it's it's uh, talking about a, 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 a foretelling of doom. So when, when describing doom, only Damascus was, was mentioned. Uh, by the Northern Kingdom, again, the, the, the kings were, were uh, more evil than the people. So God wanted to give the people a chance to repent. And we see later on in, in um, the time of Hezekiah and also in the time of, of Yoshiahu, Josiah, um, a remnant of the 10 tribes came back and joined with Judah. So even though you only had a few people from each tribe, you still had all 12 tribes of Israel by the time the first temple was destroyed. They were all living together in, in the Judean empire. Uh, that's very important. People think that all oh, the 10 tribes were exiled and cut off. And there's a prophecy um, elsewhere that uh, they will be cut off. But uh, the fact is that 
individual families and, and survivors joined back. So really all 12 sons of Jacob still has representation in the Jewish people even today. Even before you talk about uh, looking for the tribes of, of, of Dan or, or Menasha in different uh, countries. This chapter foretells the destruction of both Aram and the northern kingdom of Israel, for just as they were united in their efforts, turn the page to page 133, to, to, to destroy Judah, so too shall they, they be united in their own destruction by Assyria. So, Barbara, now. So, as it turns out, uh, they are rebuffed by, um, by Ahaz, but then they are destroyed. Uh, by the Assyrians, the Assyrians that would would attack Hezekiah, and f find their defeat uh, at the at the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, but this is also foretelling that the northern kingdom would also be destroyed by the same country. Uh, so they 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 join themselves at the hip to Aram, and so they were, were guaranteed to meet that fate. Whereas in Judah, anyone who, who left their, their village and, and escaped to Jerusalem for safety, they were protected. Uh, so the, this, um, this prophecy opens with a harsh prophecy concerning Damascus, uh, the, the uh, capital of Aram, foretelling its utter destruction. The Assyrian armies will destroy Damascus so completely that it'll be no more than a heap of rubble. Okay, let's skip to the third uh, chapter, uh, sorry, the third verses commentary in English. The stronghold will cease from Ephraim. The stronghold is Samaria, the capital of Ephraim, the Northern Kingdom of Israel. The kingdom is referred to as Ephraim because its first king, uh, Jeroboam, Jeroboam, was an Ephraimite. Also the uh, three generations of, of kings afterwards. Um, and uh, and uh, and Manaki from Damascus and the rest of Aram, just as Ephraim's stronghold will be destroyed, uh, Rezin will be killed and the Ar Aramean survivors will be exiled. Just as the 10 tribes, the glory of the children of Israel were exiled, were exiled to Hala and, and Habar, uh, in, as in uh, two, king, uh, two Kings uh, chapter 18, the Arameans were exiled to Kir. Continuing in the Hebrew on, on verse four. Gargarim, the Rosh Amir, Arba Hamisha Bisi Feho, Korea, Num Adonai El Israel. We have a translator of verses four through six. Three verses, verse four through six. I can't do it. It shall be on that day that the honor of Yaakov will diminish and the fat, fatness of his flesh grow lean. It will be as when the harvester gathers grain and his arm cuts the ears. And it will be as one who gleans ears in the valley of Rephaim. Only gleanings will remain on him like a picked olive tree with but two or three olives on the top of the highest branch or four or five on its flourishing bows, the word of Hashem, God of Israel. 
So when the uh, individual uh, survivors of the Northern Kingdom expulsion uh, were, were um, returned to Judah uh, in the times of Hezekiah and Josiah. Uh, so therefore, um, it will seem like just a, a few, um, a few uh, tw twigs of, of, of the grapes, of the grapevine uh, survived. Uh, in this case, olive tree. So now, if if you're going to pick an olive tree, generally the the lower branches you pick first. But in this case, it says only the highest branches will be saved. So therefore, um, it it won't be based on whether a person was was. A famous leader in in a prime or not? It'll be based on spiritual reasons why they survived. Uh, so it, there, it's not the convenient uh, the convenient um, picking of of a regular olive off of an olive tree. So now this is. Um, this is called a diminishment to the um, honor of Jacob. And this explains why um, also the, the language of uh, Masa, a burden, is mentioned in the start of this prophecy. Uh, but in this case, of course, it, it was necessary. It, it's like uh, if somebody had a, a limb that had to be uh, amputated, God forbid, so that they could survive a poisoning of some sort. Uh, so so um, it's not a good thing, but the end result will be for the best. Uh, so when, when people choose their own destruction, um, it's, it's not the best, not the best uh, option, but the, the goal has to be justice. And justice is according, just is according to the divine, uh, divine plan for, uh, for that. It, it can't be according to um, individual uh, perspectives, you know, like only if this or that person lives or, or dies, can this or that be right. But if the, this or that person was, was the leader of, of the movement to, to destroy um, any connection with God, the God of Israel, so therefore how could you blame the God of Israel for not protecting the people? And how could you blame the God of Israel for removing someone who was guaranteeing the destruction of his fellow uh, of his fellow people. So we have to trust in the justice of, of God. And if if we are pursuing absolute justice, which is has to be only from God's perspective, not from our uh, subjective views, then then we could also expect mercy. If we are trying to control God to have uh, our version of justice and our version of mercy, so then people end up disappointed. You know, every, every dictator in the world, every conqueror in the world had their version of justice and mercy. Uh, but if they had think, thought about God's version of justice and mercy, mercy, you know, they probably would not have been a conqueror in the first place. An exception to the rule is King David and King Solomon. So they expanded the kingdom more and more. But they did it uh, similarly to a defensive war. Sometimes they would have to um, start a war with, with a nation. They, they may have um, cast the first arrow, but only because that nation was, was a risk. Remember, in those times, uh, there were human sacrifices. They were and they, those, those places of human sacrifices, the, the Moloch worshipers included, uh, they targeted children. So it was, it was an evil beyond our, our understanding. Uh, you know, for example, in World War II, the Japanese had uh, kamikaze, kamikaze uh, fighters. Uh, but imagine if the Japanese had kamikaze fighters only of children. The only time they would sacrifice a human life to attack the enemy is if they would strap a child, God forbid, into the airplane and then attack the enemy like that. 
So that's beyond despicable, beyond beyond understanding. But that's that's who uh, King David had to deal with, and, and that's why um, they, King David kept fighting and fighting, and until um, he he reached uh, Asia Minor, he kept fighting and fighting. There's, there are so many psychos, <laughs> but uh, again, it, we don't have a. Um, I don't think there's a parable in, in modern times to the evil that King David had to face. So that explains why he kept fighting, fighting, even though uh, he was for peace, as it says in Tehillim, he was for peace and they were for war. He always wanted peace, but, you know, they, they were just, uh, they were monsters destroying their own babies. Not just that, waiting till the kids were, you know, were uh, old enough to feel pain and, and make it a greater sacrifice and then um and then they they killed him so it was it was pretty uh, brutal okay so only by following god's plan can we not not be overwhelmed by our subjective um whims and uh potentially corrupted versions of justice but god doesn't corrupt god cannot corrupt so therefore, if we keep the objective uh, truths of the Torah with us, we won't become these monsters. And again, conqueror after conqueror, except those who kept, kept close to the Torah. You know, David and Solomon added books to the, to the Tanakh. They're they they holy men. Uh, they were able to uh, follow God's plan. And so therefore, even though they conquered, it was only by God's rules. Whereas most conquerors in history, it was just a brutality after brutality and it was a um, hypocrisy after hypocrisy, a self-rationalization after self-rationalization and the innocent suffered. So, and we see here, uh, even Jacob is not spared. Those of Jacob joined with the enemy to be just like them against God's will and to be cruel to humans. Therefore, they too would share in the faith. Okay. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi it, what is this, the, the, the translation of this ger, gerim in, in the verse in English? What is that representing? In, in verse 6. Gargarin. Gargarin. Uh, the, uh, the, the, um, there can, Okay, so if you look in Matsuda's Tzion, our actual does include that. Okay. So in the Hebrew, it's the inner column. There's four columns of Hebrew text in the commentary. Uh -huh. far, the far left-hand side and page 132 of the Milstein edition of Isaiah. Correct. Okay, if you look at the verse... Uh, Okay, so the the third the third boldface um, heading of the uh, towards the bottom of, of the Matsuda Sion on that page. Okay. Gargarin. So they call fruits that are uh, lean and individual. Lean and individual. Fruits. Fruits that are lean and individual. Yeah, imagine a, a, a little uh, sprig of, of grapes, you know, like every other uh, every other bunch of grapes has like 100 grapes in it, and you get the uh, three, the, the branch with just three little grapes on it. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that'd be typical. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the, compared to how big uh, the Northern Kingdom's population was, that's the how much would remain and join Judah. I got it. 
so in, in other words, the the population of the Judean Empire was like maybe five to ten percent the Northern Kingdom tribe. The ten tribes were reduced to like only five or ten percent of the Jewish people. Oh, it's just just a small remnant was left. And you and you were also talking about that there was a prophecy that that the ten tribes would be uh, eliminated. Uh, no, it, yeah. So it's 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 it's, it's discussed in the Gemara actually. Uh, will will the ten tribes return? Uh, so it's debated. Um, one of the holy sages of the of the of the Talmud says, um, "No, no, they they, they were um, they cast out forever." Uh, one sage says they will return, and uh, one sa sage says they'll return, but not their philosophy. So, and we see today the ten, the ten tribes that are suspected in different areas, such as Ethiopia, they are converting to Judaism. Judaism is the Judean Empire. It's 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 not Israelism. It's Ju Ju Judaism. Are you starting so, to be able to see which sage is correct? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it's also that um, uh, it, it's that. Um, they, in other words, they would become a part of the, the Jewish people from the Southern Kingdom's philosophy, even though they, they're, they physically would return as individuals. Return as individuals without the philosophy of the Northern tribes. Yeah, that was utterly lost. Uh, and and um, according to Halacha, uh, they have to submit to the, the Torah as given by the, the remnant of Judah. And Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Uh, so, um, and of course, we, again, we have probably uh, five percent of the Jewish people are are also from the ten tribes, but they're mixed into Judah. We don't know for sure. All right. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. But um, so you know, the, these commentaries are are really incredible. And um, in, in some ways, the, the Hebrew is, is uh, the Hebrew of the commentary is, is greater than the English. So if you could continue in your studies until you eventually become able to um, study the original Hebrew, that would be great. The way I learned, um, the, the two best ways I learned, uh, besides well, one of them was studying Gomorrah, of course, it expanded my mind to, to be a better, uh, uh, better able to study different commentaries. But also, I studied uh, before that. I studied uh, the Chumash with Rashi, five books of Moses with the translation of Rashi. And when I read the translation of Rashi, I also read the Hebrew of the Rashi, so I could try to guess, you know, which word meant what, and I started to get an idea of it. So I, I use the interlinear uh, English translation of, of uh, the five books of Moses and then the, the interlinear uh, translation of Rashi as well. And Rashi quotes Hebrew words and he also quotes Aramaic words. And then after that, I added, um, you know, as a teenager, I added um, studies of uh, the Unculus, the, the, the Targum translation in Aramaic. And it was, it was fascinating. I, it's like every time I would do the Parsha with Targum, it's like I picked up a new word or, or up to three words in every, every week. I, I figured out, oh, this word means this in Hebrew. And that Hebrew word means this in English. So I was learning the language of the Talmud by using the Targum. Instead of the Targum teaching me about the Chumash, the Chumash was teaching me Targum which was teaching me the Talmud. Uh, so that's how per I personally was, was growing before I started to study Gemara. Okay, page 
Beinav el Kadosh Yisrael Tir Eno. Velo Yishe el Hamiz Bechos Amase Yedav Vashir Asu Etzbosov Lo Yere Vashira Vaha Asherim Vaha Chamanim. Oyam Hui Hia Arema Uzo Kazuvas Hachoresh Vamir Asher Azum Mipene Ben Israel. Vahisa Shemama Kisha Chachat Elohei Yish Ech Vetsur Mauzech. Lo zachart alkin tit e nit e naamanim uzamoras zor tiz reenu biyom nit ech tesag tesag segi uva boker zar ech tafrichi ned katzir biyom biyom nachala uchayiv anush. Okay. Translating uh, the, the English on page 135, 7 through 11. On that day, man will turn to his maker, and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not turn to the altars of his own handiwork, and to what his fingers made he will not look, nor to the Asherah trees or the sun images. On that day, his fortified cities will be like the abandonment of forests and woodlands, which they abandoned before the children of Israel, and it will be desolate. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your stronghold, because you had been planted as pleasant saplings but you sow strange shoots. On that day you were planted, you flourished, and at dawn your seed flowered, but your branch is removed on a day of affliction and acute pain. Thank you. So, um, in the time of the Northern Kingdom, there was uh, some uh, very evil kings, including um, uh, Ahab, Ahab. And during the reign of Ahab, uh, the Northern Kingdom became a manufacturer and distributor of idols. So the Asherah tree was the, the idol of choice of, um, of Ahab. And they would sell little um, tree idols and distribute it throughout the Middle East. Such such an embarrassment uh, that um, uh, a a king set up you know by God to lead the Jewish people uh, turned and, and and sold idols instead a manufacturer of idols the the the, the sin that, that is the most uh, the most uh, akin to a betrayal of God you know it's it's the opposite of gratitude. So, so therefore, when the Northern Kingdom was punished, people realized, what, why was Judah spared and, and Ephraim uh, punished? Well, if, uh, Judah kept the Torah of Moses, and Ephraim created idols and, and shared them and brought idol worship to the far reaches of the Middle East. Uh, so, therefore, what we see is in, in, in the destruction is justice. It's, it's not just human suffering. It is cause and effect. People tried to do the, the most aggravating, aggravating thing you could do in, a, in creating an idol, the most aggra aggravating thing you could do to, to, to God. And, um, and they did it for hundreds of years. God was patient, but um, it, it was after a certain point, the merciful thing was to not be patient. Uh, you know, like if there's a mass murderer, it's a, a good idea to stop him before he kills more people. If you say, well, you know, after a few more killings, if he doesn't stop, you know, we're really going to get tough with him. Well, so <laughs> you're guaranteeing more victims and, and you're not doing his soul any good either. I saw a video like that that happened recently. There was a video in New Mexico of guy got traffic stopped and then um, the cop kept asking him to come to the 
cop car and the guy was like fiddling around and then he got the guy got out of his car and um, pulled a big old giant gun on the cop and shot him like nine times and, and left him dead on the side of the road and so the cop camera from the car got all of that on video and then the driver of the big truck drove away and you could see on the video when he got on the freeway already a uh, another I think it was an unmarked car or it was a dark black car anyway and I think it had a just a marking that was hard to see but it pushed the guy's truck to make him not um, be able to drive and then so when the truck stopped he got out and another cop shot him dead uh, yeah i mean it's 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 um it's possible uh she's, she's making a connection that one who has compassion is a biblical verse or Talmudic. one who has compassion on the yeah. cruel is being cruel to the compassion yeah it's, it's a Talmudic concept of of he who is uh kind to the cruel will end up being cruel to the kind uh, so it's, it's the kind thing to do, unfortunately, is yeah. to stop the bad in its tracks. Yeah, the best thing to do is stop the bad guy in his tracks, is, is whatever it feels it. Uh, but the uh, the idea is that um, if you could um, if you could take him out in a nonviolent way, you can. Uh, and but if you have no choice, you may not be able to wait around for that. You know, it's not a right; it's an obligation, actually. Yeah. So uh, what Michael is talking about it is obligation from the Torah to, to uh, prevent the, the bad guy. Even if it means murder. Yeah. Well, even Girl if it killing. means killing. yeah, even if it means a, a um, police action uh, slaying. But the um, the idea is that uh, it's not it's not necessarily like a, a dirty hairy thing where you have to wait until you you're taking revenge, uh, you know. Uh, but it's a preventative action. And if you could do it without killing the person, that's okay. The idea is not to kill people, it's to stop death. So what, what's the best way we could do that? It's, it's a sad it's a topic and... Um, yeah. It's uh, when people uh, are, are killed, it's, it's, not, it's not good. But if we try to discuss this objectively without getting into emotions and, you know, a lot of people know people who, who were killed, you know, so I'm having memories of someone I knew who was murdered. But um, uh, if we if we look at it without emotion, the best thing to do is the bad guy should stop. And if someone is giving themselves over to terror to the extent they're like the Moloch worshipers, you know, they don't care sacrificing their own children to kill innocent people. So, you know, the, the sooner they're brought to justice, the better. Hopefully without death. But if there has to be death, only the terrorists should die. They, you cannot treat them with kid gloves. You cannot give them equal rights to regular humans. If somebody dedicates themselves to the kamikaze philosophy uh, with uh, the idea of taking down innocent civilians with them, so they have to be put down unless they could be incarcerated or or tranquilized or something but uh, th there's no such thing as uh you know well okay man go and capture him only let him kill two of you if two if he puts down two of you that's it just blow him away uh, you know so you, you know that's uh, <laughs> we don't uh, try to pick uh, volunteers to be to be killed we, we try to stop killing but again, with a lot of a lot of the psychos, they don't give you much choice. Um, but uh, you know, some things are necessary and they can't be avoided. Uh, pacifism is the normal ma methodology. But if you meet up with a terrorist, don't try to give him human rights. First, he has to be in civilized human humanity. He has to value uh, the lives, the lives of children, and women, and and uh, the elders, equally as any, anyone else. If he does, so then you can give him an equal right. If he doesn't, so then you are threatening their lives by treating a terrorist with equal rights. And 
and it's it's just um, it's just really terrifying how many uh, how many people there are on the left wing trying to give equal rights to everyone before they've repented. You know, if if you know the best way to, to say is would they trust their own children with one of these psychos as, as the babysitter? Maybe they maybe they would. Maybe they're that, they're that far gone. Maybe they're like Moloch worshippers willing to offer their children, but uh, they ain't offering my kids, <laughs> and uh, that's not the Torah way. Um, so you know we have to be willing to accept a tougher uh, stance on it. And again, nowadays there are so many forms of tranquilization, and um, and uh, you know there's tasers. If, if the police is actually using a taser, it's, it's more complicated if they accidentally use, use a gun, uh, as happened the past week. Um, but um, there's alternatives to killing. But if it when came to it, it, it came to it, you, you have to understand the, the, the murderer will kill unless he is put down. So it has to be put down one way or another, uh, you know, whatever comes to that. And it says, you know, Mashiach. Is the symbol of peace, our, our idea of, of humans who make who make peace. The Mashiach is the greatest uh, diplomat that we expect in, in the next century. Um, and it says about him that he will cause many to die with the, with the breath of his lips. He will be forced to deal with evil people, just like uh, King David, his forefather. Uh, so we have to be not offended if. If there's a good king saving lives of people, uh, you know this is part of the process of of accepting God's will. Uh, again, the three things that the Medrash uh, Shmuel explains that we need to do to to ha have uh, have Mashiach, we have to accept the will of God, God's authority, God's kingdom. We have to accept the rebuilding of the temple in its place. Jews have have uh, religious rights too, and we have to accept the Malchus based David, the king from the, from the house of David. To do that, you know, we can't let uh, any political philosophy affect us. Not right or not left. Uh, just uh, one moment. Uh, someone has a question. Achnasus Orchim. Just a moment, please. Hello, we're back. Okay, so uh, it's I've had, good. To I have to change the battery in my hearing aid. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, back. Okay. Okay, so um, any questions before we continue? We're going to go to verse uh, verse twelve. Uh, so in verse 10, we, we explain that uh, the verse says that you've forgotten the God of your salvation. I've never remembered the rock of your stronghold because you planted his pleasant saplings, but you sow strange shoots. Uh, so it's like uh, uh, someone uh, plants uh, herbs to save the lives of everyone with a special medicine. And it becomes and it becomes like um, somebody plants uh, a poison instead so he could uh, get rid of some rodents. That has nothing to do uh, with with uh, the the um, the planting, and the planting was to save lives. And instead of saving lives, um, it has become uh, it has become something um, uh, terrifying, actually. Uh, so so God is upset. He's upset that the good that was lost because they turned to evil. What would have happened if the northern kingdom didn't turn to evil? It could have reunited with the southern kingdom, and that collective peace would have been Mashiach. Time. Mashiach comes when all 12 tribes are reunited. Uh, so it didn't have to be the way it is. Um, 
but um, that that was lost in that situation. Uh, but the the southern kingdom is still faithful to God, so God will work with uh, whoever is willing to serve Him. Okay, the Hebrew on page one thirty four, the last Hebrew word, continuing on to the next page one thirty six in the Hebrew. Hoy hamonamim rabim kahamos yamim yamayun shon laumim kishon mayim kabirim yisho. Mayim <laughs> Translation verses 12 through 14, three verses. Can we have a volunteer translator? Woe to the tumult of the many nations who are as tumultuous as the tumult of the seas and to the uproar of the nations who roar like the uproar of powerful waters. Nations roar like the roar of many waters but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away. They will be pursued like the chaff of mountains before the wind and like pollen before a stormy wind. At evening time, before there is fright, before the morning dawn, he is no more. This is the lot of our assailants and the dew of our spoilers. So this literally applies, uh, according to Matthias David, it applies to Sanherib, but it's literally true. This, the army of Sanherib was destroyed right before dawn by, by a miracle, an overnight plague. An overnight plague that overtook the entire half a million man uh, army in one night, in, in, in half of a night, at, during one watch, right before sunrise. The army of Sancheru was laid, laid to waste and Jerusalem was saved. Uh, and that's coming up here in the book of Isaiah later on. It's, uh, it's exciting. The, the story about the attack on Jerusalem in the time of Hezekiah and Sancheru is recorded in three books in Isaiah, in Kings, and in Chronicles. But the book of Isaiah is actually the first chronological. So we'll get around to that in about 20 chapters or so. <coughs> of course not. We have some people here at uh, my residence as well. As well. Okay. Um, action. Okay, going on to verse 18, unless there's any other questions. Uh, one more point. Rashi on the last verse of the chapter, on verse 14, uh, discusses that uh, this could also apply to Gog and Magog, the final uh, enemies of Israel in the time of, of uh, Mashiach, uh, not only to uh, not only to Sancheru. So this um, it may also be a, an overnight. Um, victory. Interesting. Okay. Uh, chapter 18. Hi, Eretz, Tzil, Tzal, Kenafayim, Asher, Me'iver, Nahare, Chush, Hasholech, Bayam, Tzirim, Vichle, Gome. Al Penei Mayim Lachu Malachim Kalim El Goim Mamushach Umarat El Am Nora Minhu Al Goi Kav Kav Umavusa Asher Bazu Naharim Arzo Kol Yoshrei Sevel Veshoch Nei Aretz Kineso Neis Harim Tiru Vichisakoa Shofar Tishmau 
Uh, we have a volunteer translator of the first three verses. Chapter 18. Go to the land of clamorous wings on the other side of the rivers of Cush, which sends agents into the sea in papyrus vessels upon the surface of the water. Go, fleet messengers, to the nation that is dragged and plucked, to the people that inspired awe from the day it came into being and onward, a nation that is detested and trampled, whose land was ravished by kings. All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers of the earth, you will see when the banner is hoisted up upon the mountains, and when the shelter sounds, you will hear. I mean the shofar. And so when far. the shofar sounds, you will hear. Mm -hmm. And shofar is a ram's horn. So it's a, there are two uh, main cushions. Um, in, in many countries, you have the same, well, just like in America, you have the same city as, for example, the, the city of Springfield is in many states. Uh, so too, there, there's more than one cush. The two main cushions in the world is uh, a, a area encasing part of Sudan, Ethiopia, and, and Eritrea. And another Kush is uh, in India. Okay, so uh, our school prefers that this this Kush refers to the one south of Egypt, um, uh, whereas um, I remember reading another uh, interpretation about uh, it referring to the um, farther east. Because going to Kush, Mehodu Vad Kush would include the uh, Persian Empire. Mehodu Vad Kush, men mentioned in Megillus Esther, the Book of Esther, uh, referring to uh, Artaxerxes' kingdom, Ahasuerus. Was that the one that was king when Hadassah was around? Yes. Uh, so, a uh, good point. Uh, so the, the um, let's look at uh, Rashi. Um, Rashi on verse two. The bottom, the bottom uh, paragraph on uh, page one thirty-seven in the Milstein edition of Isaiah. Hashalech Bayam Tzirim which sends agents into the sea. The king who rules the nations on the other side of the rivers of Cush will send agents to the land of Israel by way of the Mediterranean Sea to see if it is true that Israel has been returned to its ancestral land. Uh, now, of course, if this prophecy were referring to Mashiach time, it could refer to either, um, either a, a, a part of India or a part of Africa. Because you know we have um, great uh, ships that can uh, travel the world, so. Uh, but in those days, it's easier to explain it according to those who say it's the African uh, Kush. Okay, let's continue. We're going to find out more about the uh, Mashiach time here in this chapter. Okay, this chapter, by the way, only has um, seven verses. So we're about to finish the chapter. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's finish the Hebrew and English translation and then just go through commentaries. And learn a little bit about the final redemption. Okay, so we left off after verse three, verse four. Ki cho amar denai lai, eshkata v'abita v'mechoni, kechom tzach alei or keav tal bechom katzir. You can be ready. 
and we have a translator, verse 4 through the end of the chapter, four verses. For this said Hashem to me, I will be at ease, and I will look after my place of foundation, like crisp, crisp warmth after the rain, like the mist of dew in the heat of the harvest. For before the harvest, when the flower is finished and the bud turns to grapes approaching ripeness, he will cut down the young branches with pruning hooks and he will remove and chop off all the twigs. They will be left, left together for the bird of prey of the mountains and for the beast of the earth and the bird of prey will feast in the summer on them and every beast of the earth will feast in the winter on them. At that time, an offering will be brought to Hashem, master of legions, namely the people that is dragged and plucked and some of the people that inspired awe from the day it came into being and onward, the nation that is oppressed and trampled, whose land was ravished by rivers, to the place wherein rests the name of Hashem, Master of Legions, Mount Zion. Yeah, so, so um, the language of the last verse, it it's, uh, reminds me of uh, when, when uh, the angel was saying to Abraham, um, your, your son, your, your, firstborn, your, your firstborn son, uh, Yitzhak. So, you know, repeating until the point was driven home. Uh, so here it, it, find, it concludes with Mount Zion trying to um, help the idolaters of the world come to grips with the idea that uh, the people that God chose are the people that God is going to stick with. Um, and, it, you know, for some people, it's a hard thing to, to grasp. But, uh, you know, God is true to his word, thank God. But we see here, it's very powerful, th this prophecy coming right after the rejection of, of the Ephraimite kingdom, is that uh, just because they're Jewish doesn't mean they have a pass. If they are faithful, then they are protected because they're fulfilling the agreement. The agreement was uh, serve God, take on an extra burden so the rest of the world can, can go on and en enjoy life, and, and you focus on serving God, and there'll be special rewards for, for the extra service. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, it's like, um, imagine a, um, a great uh, seafaring vessel that required to have a bunch of engineers holding the engine together during the, the uh, during the the, the, the travels and, and the journey through the, the oceans. And then uh, some of the engineers started to slack off. And say, How can the passengers get to rest? You know, uh, but the, you're not passengers, you're, you're engineers. So uh, Jews have to be willing to accept the extra burden upon them so that the world could, could function uh, normally. Uh, and, uh, you know, then also the other nations have to be willing to accept their, their roles as well. And, um, and the idea is God created the world for, for kindness. Olam Chesed Yibana, Psalm 89, the world was built on kindness. And um, it, it's just a beautiful thing. It's, it's the thing that unites everyone. Everyone needs, every, every human has needs. It, it doesn't matter. If they're Jewish or not, or you know any background, we all have needs, and um, 
by being merciful to each other, we're emulating God, walking in his way. And uh, we could bring all the blessings of, of God upon us for all generations. You know, all we have to do is be willing to suspend our perception of objective standards and go with God's. If you think there's truth in God's way, so then follow the ethic of the Torah and uh, let it teach you the correct way to view things. Okay, let's look at the commentary, last four verses of chapter 18. Verse 4, I will be at ease. I will look at after the, my place of foundation. My place of foundation is the holy temple. God had stated clearly that it will not be silent nor rest while Israel is in exile. In chapter 62, we'll, we'll see that prophecy here. Uh, but when the uh, redemption finally arrives, he will then rest and look favorably at his temple. It's an interesting la language Radak uses. Uh, God will look favorably at his temple. In, in a sense, God is not so concerned about the lack of his temple uh, because people are suffering still. It's a time of exile. So the point of the temple is that humans should serve God and gain merit. And uh, if people are in so much pain and confusion and, and uh, there's so much heresy in the world, people don't know which way to serve God. So God de-emphasizes his rights of being honored by us. And he, he wants us to focus on being good to each other. As in of the book of Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6, Because kindness I desire, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of, of the Lord more than burnt offerings. So our focus has to be Torah and Chesed, Torah and Chesed, Torah and kindness. And, um, and the rest will come. And if we want to honor God, you know, people go to, to a place, place of worship to, to honor God. Uh, but if you really want to honor God, so do Torah and Chesed so that we can be, deserve to have a temple again. If we have a temple again, then, then it's the start of giving God what he deserves, the appropriate respect of the, the uh, creator and sovereign of the world. So Rashi says in verse four, he's he's implying that this is talking about the final um, the final exile, our time. God declares that He will relax from the punishment of the offspring of Esau, and will turn His attention to the temple and to benefit Israel. Uh, just as the uh, just as the warmth of the shining sun and the mist of the dew of dew in the heat of the forest are beneficial to the growing plants, so too will God refresh his nation, Radak. And verse five, for behold the harvest, when the flower is finished, uh, when the flower is finished. The prophet metaphorically compares the armies of Gog and Magog, uh, the enemy of, of Mashiach, and its allies to a budding grapevine. Just as grapes slowly develop on the vine and ultimately become mature and ripe, so will Gog and Magog slowly build massive and powerful armies and weaponry, which when ripe will, will attempt to attack and crush uh, Jerusalem, Rashi. It's a debate whether or not uh, Gog and Magog has already occurred. According to many rabbis, it was already fulfilled in World War II. Uh, and the bud turns to a grape approach, like uh, approaching ripeness. The ripe grape symbolizes Gog and Magog, like grapes growing on the vine, from bud to finished fruit. Their triumph, uh, the triumphant armies will grow, and as more and more uh, troops and cavalry come, prepared to attack Jerusalem. Uh, and then. Uh, Uh, 
Okay, uh, mentioned in um, on page 138, the final redemption in the English commentary, final redemption will begin in Eretz Israel in the Holy Land. The Messiah will, will reveal himself there and Jews will converge on Jerusalem and other cities of the Holy Land. From there, awareness of the new epoch will spread to Yemen and to other lands. That's Rambam from the Geras Kaman. That was technically commentary on verse two, but uh, why, why not uh, just mention that part? Okay, continuing, page 140 in the English on the, on the bottom. He will cut down the young branches with pruning hooks. The prophet metaphorically describes the destruction of the armies of Gog and Magog. God will cut them down as one cuts down the young branches and chopped up twigs of the vine. Russian Redak will see this. God will utterly annihilate them at the very moment they are poised for victory. For they will succeed in conquering half of Jerusalem and exiling part of the people before God will strike them down. Again, I th the, uh, it's a question whether or not this has to happen literally. If you look at, uh, does if Israel must have the humiliation of having half the city taken away, well, guess what? Since uh, 1948 until 1967, East Jerusalem was taken away from, from Israel. Uh, all those years. So half of the city was conquered. So if the, the majority of the suffering was already fulfilled in the Holocaust and the, the, the curse of Jerusalem being divided in, in the defeats was already fulfilled in the formation of the state of Israel. So then we might only be waiting for good news, not bad news. Uh, this is in line with teachings of, of rabbis such as the, Lubav the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Okay. Uh, Rashi adds that when Gog and Magog will be destroyed, God will destroy the princes and rulers of Esau as well. For although Gog's land will be part of the legacy of, of Yephus, uh, Gog himself will be a descendant of Esau. One of the countries that fits in with this uh, motif is potentially, in our, in our days, potentially uh, Turkey uh, fits in with the, the potential to be Gog and Magog, according to uh, um, uh, my analysis, but also I, I remember learning there was a, uh, a rabbit who also held that uh, Turkey was, was a possible uh, possible source of Gogumaga. That's only according to those who say Gogumaga still must literally happen as far as a, a large army from somewhere from the north attacking uh, Jerusalem. Again, according to the other opinions, like Baba Terebi, there's no there's no need for any such war. All the um, all the major uh, difficulties of of the Legalis have already been fulfilled. Commentary on verse six: They will be left together for the bird of prey of the mountains and for the beasts of the earth. Isaiah foretells that the birds of prey and beasts of the, of, of the earth will gorge themselves on the abundant corpses of the defeated armies. Uh, this is discussed in Ezekiel chapter 39. Although the Jews will labor strenu strenuously to bury the dead and spend seven months doing so, they will be unable to bury so many without the help of birds and beasts, according to Radak. Uh, according to another commentary um, on, I, for I forget which book of Tanakh I was reading that commentary. And I forgot which commentary it was, but I read it. There, there's a commentary that says that there will actually be a commandment to leave the bodies. In all other cases, uh, we're supposed to not let a body remain overnight in the Holy Land. Um, but in this case, it will be like a memorial 
uh, the, the, these, this foolish army dared to threaten the power of, of the God of Israel. Um, so if there's a literal war of Gog and Magog, so it would be a, something of a miraculous uh, defeat of the army, uh, where, to the point that there will never again be a desire for war. In other words, there must be some sort of supernatural element that takes place. There is different accounts of what that war could be, and uh, you know it's it's amazing. God left many levels of what could be if there still needs to be a gogamoga. It doesn't have to be um, this or that. It could be this or that. Is it safe to say that by the description, um, it, the is, it is a nuclear type of war because of the speed of the war, the instantaneousness of it? The amount of people that it will kill, and the way it describes the the shockwave, like birds are going to feel it, the trembling is going to be in the water, no structures, uh, structures are going to topple, rocks are going to be flattened, mountains uh, are going to split. Well, so, um, hiding in cave in 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 in, 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 in the in, in, inside the question, mountains. The question that Rabbi Hill has is 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 is, is it uh, is the war going to be a nuclear war? Uh, if there is a need for what a war. And uh, there are different prophecies describing uh, hiding in caves and, and um, destruction of buildings in an instant. And there's a uh, two thirds of humanity. Uh, there's a, a question of whether a, a certain portion of humanity could be lost. And, and there's even a, uh, a Gomorrah or Medrash, I think it's a Gomorrah also, that uh, talks about the war lasting just a few seconds. That which. Okay, so um, the the uh, so the uh, it's it's a very good point. But all of these things, I think, is that there we have something like ten or twenty different potential levels on that time. That when, would be a worst case scenario, right? So there there's like a whole range of options, and and we we now live in an age when you could have a whole range of of, of possible things. In, in addition, when uh, the prophet says the land will be destroyed, uh, no, not necessarily. Yes, when when he says the land will be destroyed, um, generally speaking, when the word Haaretz is used, it refers to Eretz Israel. Mm. When when it doesn't say a name with, of a, with a capital T. Yeah, yeah. So that, what that means is the reason why it's such a horrible threat is because it's it's the holy land and and the, the fate of the jewish people is at stake and if, if the jews go so then uh it, it's not good for the rest of the world because because god uh continued the world after the deluge because there would be a group of people serving him uh and if if, if they go uh, so then the world is in trouble uh, who's going to fill the extra role um so therefore, that's that's why the biblically, there's like a, a very big, great concern about the time of of, uh, of a final war. Uh, however, so when the, it says in in um, Zechariah the destruction of of, of the of the, the Haaretz, it doesn't mean the entire world has to be destroyed. Uh, people who who have read the New Testament like the idea, <laughs> or may not like the idea, but they like interpreting it. As the entire world going, uh, be, because of the language of the, some of the books there, uh, but really, um, from a Tanakh's perspective, it's just a question of a part of the land of Israel being in jeopardy. It, 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 there's nowhere it says Kol Ha'olam Kulo, the entire world. It just says Har, it's the, the land. There's no reason to assume it's going to be the entire world. Uh, Except midrashically, there are interpretations. So there, there's a potential for it to be um, possibly uh, a, in the form of a nuclear war. However, um, based on the preponderance of prophecies that I read, I don't think it would be nuclear war. Because immediately after Gogomoga, immediately after there is a settlement. And the problem with the nuclear war, radiation. there's radiation, there's fallout, there, there's sectors you cannot settle. There becomes zones that are just cut off, lay it to waste. You know the world has been used to it, and even in a conventional war, you still have to sweep all the shrapnel so kids could play safely. So it's a, it's a big cleanup job. But 
to have um, huge zones of the earth that are off limits because of radioactive waste. I, you know, it just it doesn't yeah, seem doesn't, to fit doesn't, doesn't, the, 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 the post-World uh, War uh, follow prophecies. Up, follow up question. Follow up question. Doesn't, uh, doesn't the advent of the Gula uh, allow for God to shake the chessboard and really reset it, even if it violates nature to sort of reformat it? Like it's not if, if God could bring global peace and change our hearts to not have ego, he, it's probably not such a big, uh, it's not such a far stretch to think he's going to modify physics and suspend some of the laws for a little bit in order to reset the scene. Okay, so so from from a Tanakh perspective, your question is, um, can God, according to His own rules, reset uh, the world with severe troubles? Using uh, that as the turning point, as, as using it as a turning point. Yeah, that, that's the backup plan. That's that's the failsafe. It, Isn't it's what uh, Psalm seven says? Uh, oh, sorry. Could you uh, part of your words? Uh, Psalm sixty seven says the or it's the mm -hmm. next. It's the next to the last verse where he talks about uh, the earth will have yielded its produce. And God will bless Israel. God will bless it's three times. It says God will bless Israel. Mm -hmm. But it also says in the commentary at the bottom, when you're studying Psalm 67, that the promise is a complete renewal of the earth. That's that 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 is the code for what those words are saying. Right. Well, in, in complete renewal of the earth, so we're the question is, in what sense, at, at, also at what time? Is it talking? How old yeah. Right. Is it talking, for example, in another thousand years? According to a nuclear scenario, you're talking about a thousand years later. You understand? It's it's yeah, it's a complicated. Right. Nuclear is a problem uh, from the perspective of other prophecies, although it fits into some interpretations of certain verses, uh, but. Um, it seems more likely it's something less than that. And uh, according to one commentary, I think it may have been even a sort of stuff, but there was one commentary who said that, um, that the, the war of Gogomoga will not be a war. If that is a war. The war of Gogomoga will be a brave virus. Yeah. In other words, a pandemic. I read previously, um, well, yeah, it's so uh, before I, I quote from there, let me just say, in Psalm 67, it also says, to let known among in the in the land your way, among all the nations your your salvation. Okay, so it this is not a declaration of war against <laughs> the people of Earth. This this is no, a, a desire I, to, I didn't to, think uh, it was. I thought it was a psalm of peace. Right. The, right. This Psalm sixty-seven says God wants to teach the world of His way, and um, uh, and all the nations of His salvation. First of all, all the nations that kind of implies every nation will live. Okay. It, it doesn't say all, all the righteous nations. All nations. We see throughout history and forget it over and over in Tanakh, God gives people a chance for repentance. And remember, I remember when, when God declared that he had enough of people to be blood. So, he gave, he gave them uh, 120 years to repent before he wrote the At the, the time, he did the, the, the great destruction for their sins. So God, at the height of his rage, uh, said, that's it. In 120 years, you're finished. <laughs> Unless you repent. <laughs> I know. He's very merciful beyond <laughs> anything we could. I mean, he's exactly. being angry. We're way beyond understanding how merciful he is.
Okay, and and quoting the the uh, another verse from Psalm sixty seven. Yismachu viranu leumim. Rejoice and sing to the nations. Ki sishpot amim mishor, because the nations will be judged justly. Uleumim baaretz tanchem zela, and and the nations in the world will be comforted forever. I, I guess it must be nukes. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think that God is bigger <laughs> than we could think He would do. He's He's able to do yeah, whatever I, He chooses. Yeah, right? I, I don't think it'll be nukes. Oh, yeah, God could do anything, and um, uh, it 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 just doesn't seem to fit into the rest. But again, uh, God only promised to not destroy the world with a flood. He did not promise to not destroy the world with fire or earthquakes or anything else or meteors or anything. God has the options on the table before him. But time and again, he chooses mercy and, and to give a chance at another attempt at, at education. Why um, did Hashem uh, have to end the world with fire? Because even though he promised not to end it with the flood, that's kind of like saying, well, I'm not going to burn your house down, but I'm going to crash your car. Well, no, <laughs> but he didn't end the world that way. You see, we're still here. See, right? Yeah, but there's Gehenna coming. Oh, Gehenna, you know, that's only people who don't repent. But obviously everyone here is, is learning Torah. They want to repent. And, and everyone in the world wants to repent uh, when they see that uh, God is real. And, uh, you know... According to some of the media, they talk about the, leaders, the political leaders as world powers. Uh, that's that's almost um, that's it's almost like uh, creating a uh, idolatrous pantheon about, about politicians. It's, it's a little bit uh, ridiculous. Uh, God is is the king of the world. Uh, some people realize that, um, and they realize that. You know, when, when he promised to never break his word to Israel, he meant it. And therefore, guess what? The Jews are not doing bad. They're actually doing good. So then they can ask the question, okay, what does the Torah say? But right now, there's, there's a, a thousand different religions. And the nations that God wants to save uh, are being confused. So we need Mashiach as soon as possible. Okay, so that, that's, verse, so that's Psalm 67. It definitely does not sound like there's going to be a, a utter destruction um, in Mashiach time. In addition, uh, let's go back to the other verse. Let's see. End it. Okay, so the last chapter of Zechariah, chapter 14. So it mentions that there will be a plague and then the plague will return and affect animals. And that is ex exactly what happened with the current virus. I think we lost your sound, Rabbi. Hello, can you hear me? Checking, checking. Um, past half a minute, we couldn't. Okay. After you said something about the virus, we lost you. Uh, yes, yeah. so if you look in chapter 14, you find two verses. Um, it, it mentions about a, a virus in the summer that, that would apparently, Bakai to the Chorif. Yeah. Uh, so that, that apparently refers to last year. That would be verse, um, verse uh, chapter 14, verse 8 in Zechariah, Zechariah. And then Zechariah, uh, chapter 14, verse 15. It talks about uh, 
וכן תהיה מגיף הסוס, הפרק הגמל והחמור, וכל הבהמה אשר יהיה במחנות ההימה, המגיף הזוז. So that in, in uh, verse 15, talking about it spreading to animals, and it will be a, a, a plague like, like this plague. In other words, this is a possible uh, Hebrew translation of the concept of mutation, a mutated version of the same plague. Kamagefa, like the plague, hazos, this plague. Fascinating. Okay, so, so the commentary, I believe in this chapter, one of the commentaries uh, says that uh, this is Gogomoga, a plague, not an actual war. So check that out. Okay. So, and then finishing up in um, uh, chapter 18. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 Mama, please. Uh, okay. So, okay, then if you look on uh, the column on page 141, the last paragraph. Uh, to the place where in rest the name of Hashem, Master of Legions, Mount Zion, the nations will bring the, those Jewish people who remain. Lost you again. Have we lost him or? Yeah. Well, I've heard him all along up until now, but he was breaking up on me pretty bad there for a few minutes. So well, he, he took his he took his cameras off. Mm -hmm. think it's uh, he may be coming back in. I wonder if the crowd in his apartment is uh, maybe using Wi-Fi or somehow causing a drain on his computer. I don't know what. All right. Well, I guess he's gone, and I don't know if he's coming back in or if he left. But uh, I guess we will conclude right there. And uh, I texted him on Facebook now to see if he's going to get that. Okay. Well. Let's go ahead and just conclude right here. We're at uh, an hour and a half, and uh, I think we'll just resume next week. All right. Okay. Thank All right. you. Thanks, everybody, Thank you, for coming. Thank you. Good night. Thank Bye -bye. you, Russell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.